Well, hello everyone. Thank you all for joining World Learning's third webinar in our four webinar series, ELT Classroom Connections. If you've been to another one of our webinars before, thank you so much for coming back. Uh, today's webinar, Using AI to Support Differentiated Instruction in ELT, is designed to help you discover the power of real-life application in language learning. Our speaker, Sarah Davila, will explain practical ways to utilize generative artificial intelligence, or AI, tools for creating tailored educational materials across the four language skills. You will learn how to incorporate AI to support differentiation of learning materials and content, and together we will explore AI as a means to deliver tailored differentiated experiences that develop language and AI literacy skills, which are critical for success in the 21st century. The session will include an overview of the differentiated instruction framework, discussions on AI tools, and example lessons for productive and receptive skills that you can take and adapt for your own classroom. Please expect this session to be interactive and full of practical tools that will make you think, discuss, and plan for your next lessons. Uh, so this webinar is presented by World Learning Inc. For over 90 years, World Learning has offered an array of TESOL programming, including intensive and customized training courses, leadership building, professional development for teachers, and educational system strengthening. We believe that when teachers are better educated and better equipped, they are better positioned to motivate and empower their students in their language learning. World Learning is excited to offer this webinar series as an additional resource. Okay, with all that being said, I'm pleased to introduce our, introduce our speaker today, Sarah Dabala. Uh, I will let her speak a little bit about herself and get us started. She has a lot of really interesting things to share and I think we're all excited to hear. So Sarah, please uh, take it away. All right, hello and good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're calling in from. Um, I am Sarah Davila. I'm super excited to be here today and to, to really share some of the things that I know about differentiated instruction and AI. But before we begin, I would love it if you can find that chat box. If you're on a computer, it's gonna be a little bit easier. If you're on your phone, I know it's a, a little frustrating to go back and forth, uh, but I'd love to know where are you calling in from today and what type of learners do you teach? Are you working with adult English language learners? Are you working with young learners inside of the, the pre-K or maybe the K-12 system? Maybe you're working with university students. I would love to see some things um, to just understand who you are and who you're teaching with and where you're in from. I can uh, see Gina here. Gina, are you in the Czech Republic? That's great. Uh, let's see, who else do we have here this morning? Uh, Farah Dun from Indonesia. I know it's pretty late over there in Indonesia, so thank you so much for joining us. All right, I see Adam from Myanmar. Oh, Adam, thank you so much for being here today. Um, ba from Gambia. Eva Romano is from Panama. I know Eva. Eva is a fan. She's in the audience, and I just recently saw her in person in Panama. Uh, we have Yassine from Algeria. Joe Dale from the UK. Wow, we were already kind of see we have all over the world here. Some more Indonesia. Oh, fantastic. Mohammed from Rabat. So many people coming in from Indonesia. India, I see India in there. Sahula from India, Kerala, India, fantastic. More Algeria, Montenegro. Look at all, are we some high school teachers in Indonesia, some junior high school teachers? Fantastic, Rana from Libya. There are so many teachers here from all over the world. Zenia, I know Zenia Polosova. Hello, Zenia, it's very nice to have you in the audience as well. I, I see so many names and so many people that I recognize, so many countries that I have had the pleasure to teach in. I am so excited to have you here today. While we are going through this session, if you have some ideas or if you want to share some of the tips or if you've worked with differentiated learning before and you want to share some um, ways that you've used this in your classroom, feel free to jump into that chat and let me know. I will be taking a look at that all throughout the session today. I have a lot of questions for you, so you're going to be able to answer those. And if you found there's usually an emoji button, I love good emojis where we can share smiley faces, things like that. If you can't find the chat, but you find those emoji buttons, that also works for me very well. I see, okay, we've got some more people calling in from Tunzestan. Lib more Libya, the Mediterranean, Cyprus, my goodness, so many different places, and Virginia in the United States. So we've got a little bit from all over the world. I think that's fantastic. Hopefully you're all very excited to learn about differentiated instruction 
and artificial intelligence. So my name is Sarah Davila. I call myself a learning alchemist. Um, what I like to do is use pedagogy and research to create magic in our classrooms. I've been using evidence-based uh, practices in education for about 15 years now, and I love to introduce these things to teachers. Um, I'm also the ESL Research and Policy Analyst for IELTS USA. Um, IELTS, of course, all over the world, and we have a group inside of the US that supports those students who wanna take the test here. I have been a world learning TESOL trainer. I lived, I lived and breathed TESOL for about three years um, professionally in South Korea. So I love everything to do with TESOL training. And of course, once you start training teachers, you really never stop. How can you? Um, I've done a lot of curriculum development. <clears throat> I've written some books, some books some of you may be using, I have written or designed. Um, I'm very often seen in presentations and publicly. And I have two adorable dogs that you're not gonna get to meet today. Um, but they're sleeping next to me because they, they, they don't find these presentations to be very interesting at all. So we have a couple of things that we're going to go through today. First, we're going to review the uh, review and identify the framework for differentiated instruction um, in order to use the uh, AI for DI, which is kind of my, my shorthand for this session. We need to understand what differentiated instruction is and how that can work in our classrooms. Then we're going to take a little bit of a dive into generative AI tools. What in the world is that? And we'll get to explore and play around with those things. We're going to look at how we can use AI tools to support us in the classroom with differentiated instruction. And then finally, we'll look at um, a couple of ways that your students might be able to use AI in the future. So I think this is going to be a fantastic session. We have a lot to do, and we're going to go ahead and get started with an interaction because I think it's always fun to have questions first thing. So I'm going to show you some sentences. And what I want you to tell me in the chat is do you agree with this statement? or do you disagree? And I'd also like to know if, you, if you're a fast typist, I know we all type at different speeds, but it doesn't matter if you're fast or slow, go ahead and share your ideas. Why do you agree or disagree? So is, if everybody's ready, we're going to go ahead and get started. Here's my first statement. Teachers need to respond to the learner, not textbooks. What do you think about that teacher? teachers, uh, lots of teachers here, when you are teaching the classroom, is the job to be with the, the, the students or the text? All right, let's see. Enshin says agree. Rana, agree. Harris, I'm starting to see a lot of agreements. Yep, Teddy, Matiri, Javier. Uh, Javier says it fo you want to be able to focus on the student needs. Very important when we're working on it with our students, where really our goal here is to make sure our students are well supported. Um, lots of agrees. Selene agrees. Maldi, Olina, I love it. I see lots of agreement here. So I think we're all in agreement. Our job as teachers is always to think about the learners and the learner needs first. Otherwise, what are we doing? That's a great question. If we're not responding to the learners, what are we doing? I agree. All right, here's another statement. You can adjust your content for your learners and still meet the needs of your curriculum outcomes. I know a lot of us work inside of that K-12 system where we have very specific curricular outcomes. So can you adjust that content and still do that? All right, still looking at uh, making sure we address our, we should always prioritize our learners. Absolutely. Uh, Hala says he could not agree more. They could not agree more that you need to adjust that content. Strongly agree. <laughs> I like all of the ways we're finding to say agree. Dana Alina says agree, Olina is agreeing. All right, so lots of agreement here. I think it's it's sometimes teachers struggle with this, is how do I do both of those things? But I also, I think so. Everything is possible with AI. That's, I, lots of things are possible, may, and maybe everything, we'll find out. All right, I'm seeing lots of great answers. Um, Hala says it's common practice. It is challenging, which here, I think that's true. Sometimes adjusting content and meeting those outcomes can be challenging. So here's another quick statement. There are different ways to process knowledge. What do we think about that? I, I see a quick Amina absolutely agrees. Um, I, I, that's a very strong agreement. It's very absolute. I love that. Um, I think this is a, a great little statement here. Sometimes I, I see differences here. Totally agree. Not in this audience. I should know who my teachers are here. Definitely, Latifa says, uh, using uh, 
Terminus is using more technology. So yeah, we're using more technology that's giving us new ways to process knowledge. And when you think about it, it's that process that we go through of learning really and how we create meaning um, with the things that we're learning inside of the classroom. There are lots of differences there. Rosina says definitely, absolutely. I, I'm, I love all of the agreement here. It's so positive. All right, let's, let's do one more. Teachers can vary the types of products to show student learning. So with this question, what we're trying, we're, with this statement, when we say types of products, it means the things that your students do or produce, like the answers on a worksheet or a completed task, maybe they're following instructions and they have to complete something. So those would be different types of products. Um, so what do we think? I see, of course, from uh, Hassan, Atifi says, so true. Schematic can be processed in different ways. So that's right. If you're working with your different types of schema or going back to processes, those can be very different there. Very nice. I see a thumbs up from Eva. Thank you, Eva. I love a good emoji. Um, the emojis come up in the corner, so I might not always see them, but I do love to see those. I see lots of agrees and some thumbs up. Great. Um, I think this is true. When we're working with our students, there are lots of different ways that we can allow them to show their learning. And we need to keep that in mind. All right, my final question or my final statement here is not a question. The learning environment, that's where our classroom is, where we teach our students, it can be many spaces, is a living, breathing space that can both help and hinder our learners. So what do we think about that? The learning environment. Sometimes that's a classroom, sometimes it might be a different place. Uh, what do you think? I see some absolutely. I see uh, products for learning, depending on their learning preferences. I think that's very true. Good thing to see learning preferences there. Very important. We agree. We sh it should help and not hinder learners. And I think many of us, I, I've been teaching for many years. I know you have as well. I've been in a lot of different classroom environments. I still remember one where I came in and it was all rows of desks and the desks were so heavy you could barely move them. But we found a way because I realized the students could not talk to each other in that environment. So we had to find a way to make sure it didn't hinder our learning. Yeah, facilities and resources can play a significant role in how our students learn. So I think we've come to a lot of agreement here, which is fantastic. I love to see so much agreement. And that, that's really where we're getting into with differentiated instruction. Differentiated instruction is really thinking about all of these different aspects of what we do with our students to help support them in the classroom. And, you know, I, does anyone here, I'm about to show a definition of differentiated instruction to see if we can get on the same page. So if you're ready, we've already explored it a little bit, but let's get into this. So Carolyn Tomlinson, if you love to read research and books, um, I do have a link to her book on differentiated instruction. Um, so that will be shared out after the session today so you can read that. And you can see here on the screen, this is her definition of differentiated instruction. Differentiating instruction means shaking up what goes on in the classroom so that students have multiple options for taking in information making sense of ideas and expressing what they learn. I've got a lot of English teachers here who can tell me what that idiom means. There's a, a little idiom in there shaking up. What is that? I'm going to look. I, it's always fun to have a, a new idiom. Hopefully we know this one. I'm taking a look over here. So we're seeing uh, the learning environments. Teachers need to provide the best conditions they can in which to learn. Very true, talking about some of those previous statements. Um, some students are slow, we need to help them. Very true, we need to adjust for our students. So shaking up, if that's a new one to you, that, that means you're shaking it up, literally kind of shaking up, mixing it, changing. Um, so what Carolyn is recommending here with differentiated instruction is that we need to change what we're doing to make sure that what's happening in the classroom is going to make sense for our students. It's building on learners' needs and their intelligences. Very good. That was from Hala. Um, to activate, we want to activate for our students. Combining, Muhammad's is shaking up, combining or mixing. That's right. We're, we're doing something different. We're changing it. We're making something new. And that's what's fantastic about differentiated instruction. It doesn't mean that you're not going to achieve your objectives. 
It doesn't mean making some content easier for students because often teachers interpret differentiation as, oh, I have an easy activity and a hard activity. That's not what we're thinking about. Um, what we really want to get you with differentiated instruction is how we can change what we're doing in a couple of different ways to support our students' learning. Um, scaffolding, that's a good example of differentiation. We bring a lot of uh, scaffolding in to help differentiate. Active, making sure our students are critically involved. Varying the types of instructions, that's from Rana. Um, using uh, varied ICQs, that's right, and uh, can be a part of your instruction. Restructure and reorganize, I love that. And provoking students' interest, these are all aspects. So I'm going to put this framework up on the screen. And these are the guiding principles of differentiated instruction. And I think that this is very helpful for when we think about what we want to do when we differentiate in the classroom. And I, I've been, I started doing differentiated instruction back in about 2007, and it's been a, a big part of my work um, in the field personally. I always think about how can I differentiate in these ways. So you'll notice that with the, there are just three principles that's easy to keep in mind. First, we want to have respectful tasks. So I'm gonna ask a question, sometimes it's controversial, but we have a lot of teachers here, so I'm curious. Um, for example, if I'm working with adult learners of English, is it appropriate to bring in materials from a kindergarten level class? Is that going to be appropriate there? I'm asking that question. So you're teaching adults, would you bring in materials for kindergarten students to teach this about? I immediately see never, right? I know, why is this controversial? <laughs> it might depend on the content of the lesson, that's true. Eva Romas, uh, she says no. Latifah's no way, right? And what are some of the reasons why we would not bring that, that in? Ron, Ron is right there, appropriacy of the materials. So when you think of respectful tasks, that's always one of the first things that I think about. Is the task or the activity that I'm bringing into my students appropriate? Does it respect their knowledge? Does it respect their experience? Does it respect their backgrounds? These are all extremely important questions. You may have the best activity in the world, but if it's not appropriate for your learners, then it's not a great activity to bring into that classroom. Um, and it depends why you're doing it. There might be times when it's very appropriate to bring that in. Maybe you're just having fun. Maybe your adult students wanted to see some materials for younger students. There could be times when it would be very appropriate, but we need to think about what's the most respectful for our learners. Cultural background, gender, age should be considered very much so, very true, from again, from Rana. Um, Svetlana says the immediate answer is no, but it could be with adaptation. I agree, sometimes I'll look at something and I think, oh, I could adapt this to make this appropriate to adults, but I need to differentiate this. And so that's really what we want to get to. Maybe that material is appropriate, but we need to differentiate it to make sure it's respectful. Um, the next thing that we think about, and teachers tell me, I'm sure that you do this, who has groups inside of your classroom? Who is working with groups? And my second question, do you have fixed groups where the students always work with the same students all the time? Or do you have flexible groups? I'm kind of curious, I'll take a peek there. Um, so this is a, so I see a no. So it's a very different question. With group work, it can be very different. So we've got some varying, varying is important from Rana. Shula has flexible groups. Um, Dana Alina has flexible groups. Ehrman, flexible. I see lots of flexible grouping. When I, I, I love flexible grouping and I used to work with very large group classes. So I would sometimes have between 40 and 60 students in my class. And in that environment, I did have what I called a home group. That was their home base they started working in. But then during the activities or for certain types of sessions, I would mix my students up and have very flexible groups. So I think that's something that we always want to keep in mind is how can we make sure, especially in English language learning, that our students are always working with some different people. And then finally, we need ongoing diagnostic assessment. Can anyone tell me in the chat, what does diagnostic assessment mean? It's a little bit different from just regular assessment. I love diagnostic assessment. Adela says flexible groups. I encourage to have different partners and different activities. I love that. Um, Eva Ramos says uh, ex it's accessing prior knowledge. That's right. We, we assess to understand their prior knowledge to check our learners' understanding. 
knowing the levels. Mm -hmm. It can be like a pretest. And, and I think the one thing I would say is it's not always prior knowledge. It's also to understand how well did my students learn the materials I presented today? That's what the diagnosis is. It's like a doctor. You get to the end of your 45 minute class and you check to see if your patient is still alive. And sometimes with our students, they're wherever they're, whatever they learned today was very interesting, but maybe it wasn't the objective. I think we've all had that class where it's like you come out and you're like, I had a great time. I don't know if we learned anything today. So that's a place where diagnostic assessment can be very helpful. I see some big emojis there and lots of laughing, it's true. Um, so this is a really good way to make sure that before you move on to your next activity, you're making sure that you're learning that content that's important foundation there. Um, diagnostic assessment is a form of pre-assessment or pre-test. You can do it as a pre-assessment and you can also do it as an end of class assessment. It's just ongoing assessment of your students and how well you're meeting those objectives. Very nicely done. So these are the guiding principles of differentiated instruction. And this is actually the framework of differentiated instruction. So why do we do differentiation? What's the purpose of that for our students in the classroom? So firstly, what we want to do is to make sure that we're differentiating either the content, the process, the product, or the affect for our emotions and the environment for the space that we're in according to our students readiness interest and learning profile and when you look in that first column those purple boxes content process product that's in order generally as as teachers will start first with the content i might have two different content pieces for my students then we might differentiate the process that becomes a bit trickier sometimes Finally, we might differentiate the product, having different expectations of what students will produce based on the students that we have in the classroom. Um, and finally, the environment. Sometimes the environment is very difficult to differentiate and sometimes we don't have a lot of control over those environments. But, but whenever we have the opportunity to do it, being able to change up our environment can be very beneficial to our students. And we're always going to do this based on our students' readiness. Where are they currently at and where do I want them to be in the future? So we're never, when we're as educators, I think one of the biggest challenges is we're never teaching current state. We're always thinking about where are my students going? What's the end of the journey and how do I keep pushing them to where they need to be so they can meet their goals? That's their current readiness and where they need to be in the future. Students' interests, I'm sure you all know more about your students than you ever wanted to. All the time, you know their favorite foods, their friends, what they like to do on the weekends. Sometimes if you're teaching the older students, we know about boyfriends and girlfriends. We always know about readiness and interests. And then their learning profile. These are important things for us to do as teachers. So we're, we're doing this type of differentiation. I wanted to show you what this looks like. And I understand if you're working on your phone, this might be very small, but that's okay. I've, I've broken this out so we'll be able to see it. Um, what we're going to look at are two different uh, differentiation, differentiated ways in which my students can work with the same type of reading material. So for this differentiated example, we're using the skill of reading. And I'm going to go ahead and I'll show you, I have two groups. I have my A group that's going to be on the left side and my B group is on the right side, but let me show you what's happening here. So for this lesson, I have some vocabulary. So this will be the vocabulary. I'm pre-teaching my vocabulary before my students begin their reading activity. I'm sure many of you do something like this where you'll have your students work with a few words before they do the reading. I take a look at the words. You'll notice here that I, I do have a scale here. Um, does anyone know what this is? A2, B1, B1 plus? B2 plus, what is that? If you know, go ahead and type it in the chat. If you don't know, that's okay. You get an opportunity to learn something new. I, I, I was hoping, there we go, CEFR. That's right, that's the level of learners. And if anyone has super fast typers, if you wanna spe spell that out, what does the CEFR stand for? Students level. If you're working with um, students, many teachers will be familiar with this scale. The CEFR is the Common European Framework 
of reference. Now that, that CEFR, it doesn't mean it's only for Europe. It's the common framework of reference because everyone globally now is using that for languages. So it's very, very useful. So you'll notice I have a couple of different words. The A levels in the CEFR, I'll show this to you on the screen. If you're in the A levels, that's actually the beginning of the scale. And as the students move into the B levels, that's where we move into our pre-intermediate and intermediate work. And then finally, we get into the high intermediate work. That's going to be our C1 and our C2 level. So you'll notice that in my class, I have student, I have a lot of A2 words and then some B1 words. So I'm trying to help my students make a little progress into new levels of language ability. And quick question, if you look at these words, well, we'll, we'll kind of get into it. You'll notice this word pensioner. Um, that's going to be fun. If you're, I'm kind of curious if you can guess as we go through the examples, what type of English are we learning here? Because there are a couple of things. So we're going to take a look at the group A. You'll notice my group A, this, this group is a little bit lower level ability. They're A1 to A2. So they're kind of, they're, they're in that beginner, upper, uh, high beginner space. And these students need a lot of scaffolding. So to scaffold my students, I'm giving them the word. They can read the word, they see the word, and they have the definition. I'm going to have them match the word and the definition. This is very heavily scaffolded because my students, through pro as they continue to match the words, they can eliminate some words, they can find the meanings for the words they don't know a little bit more easily. Very heavily scaffolded to make sure that all of my students, by the time they're finished this activity, will understand the definitions for these words before they do the reading. Um, and so this is a very general English lesson. Uh, this is this this activity is primarily this is a teenager. So my working group here might be anywhere between 16 to early uh, university. It's in that age range for students, for teachers who are curious about that. So this is a very heavily scaffolded piece. This is really going to support my students because these students need that level of support. However, like many teachers on the call today, I have heterogeneous classes. So all of my students are at slightly different levels of ability. And for this reading activity, I have some students that really need to be challenged a bit more. I could give them that activity, but they would be a little bit bored. They would find it kind of easy. I'm not really helping them learn those words or reinforce that learning. So for my B group, which is a slightly higher level of English, I'm providing them with a different activity. And you'll notice here that what I'm having my students, all they're going to get is the definition. I'm not going to give them the word because I have a feeling the students already know these words. So this is creating a bit more challenge. Now my students have to recall information. That's really allowing my students to work with language they've previously internalized, but they're still doing the same thing as the A group. They're matching the word to the definition. And I can extend this a little bit more. If I have A groups and B groups in my class, and if some a student in my B group says, teacher, I, I don't know how to spell this word. So maybe they're looking at, you know, someone who is between 13 and 19 years old and like, I, I don't know how to find it. I don't know the spelling of that word. Then I can actually do some mixing here and say, oh, well, go ask a student in the A group. They, they have the spelling of the words. And so this way, I can even have my students supporting each other, even at the different levels. There's no, no shame, no guilt in having a differentiated content. It just means we have slightly different levels of scaffolding. And if my A students finish this activity very quickly and say, hey, we want to do the word search, of course you can do the word search. There's nothing wrong with that at all, because now you're moving to a different level of challenge. So this is a wonderful way to differentiate your pre-teacher vocabulary, adjust it for student levels, keeping your students engaged, um, but making sure that everyone has a challenge that's appropriate for their readiness. And we can do the same with the reading passage that we're working with as well. So here for my A group, because again, they're at the slightly different level, they're a little bit lower, they need a little bit more scaffolding. So I have given my students here some comprehension questions. These are very basic comprehension questions. I think we've all done this type of work before. We're familiar with that. So they're just going to read and answer the questions. They can go back and check the reading and find their answers. It's very simple. 
However, my B group, remember, they're at a slightly higher level. So I want to challenge them a little bit more. Same thing. They're answering the exact same questions. All four questions that we just saw in the question format are included in this graphic organizer. The difference is, is that this organizer is a little bit less scaffolded. They actually have to go through and read a little bit more deeply in the passage to find and tease out these answers to complete the graphic organizer. Both of my groups of students are doing the same work. They're going to come out with the same answers but they're doing that in a slightly different way. So I think that one of those things to keep in mind, again, is that based on the student's readiness and their learner profiles, I can differentiate that content and push my students a little bit differently. Um, and I, I love this, is that Karina says, this activity would also enable teachers to know more about learners' likes and dislikes. Very true, sometimes even though their level of ability is high, they don't love doing graphic organizer work. So that, that can be something that might come out there. So there are lots of different ways that that can appear in the classroom, but this is a really great way to, to differentiate that instruction. And then finally, and this is, I think you'll find this very interesting, all of the groups, both A and B, are going to do the C and D activity together. So they're going to answer these questions. This is going to focus more on some of those um, colloquial expressions that are in the passage. And then we have a group activity where students are going to share some of the things that they do in their free time. So by bringing all of this together, I make sure that all of my students end up in the same place by the end of the activity, but they're going to take a slightly different pathway to get there inside of our learning. So again, you can see it's it's very similar objectives. My for my B lesson, it's it's got a slightly more complication. They're looking for more specific information, whereas my A students are really just trying to understand the theme. Uh, we're doing the A level is different for my A, my lower group. They're going to match my higher group. They're doing the word puzzle. My reading tasks are just a little bit different, but we're doing the same things. We're getting the gist, scanning for details, um, digging into questions and inference, and finally we get into that post activity. So that is how differentiated instruction works. That's how we differentiate for the classroom. Before we move on, do you have any final thoughts or comments here on differentiated instruction and how you can use that for your students? Because next, we're going to talk about how we can do it with AI, and that's going to be a lot of fun. So before we move on, any other final thoughts about differentiation? I'm going to go and jump and read the chat too. Karima loves the activity. Thank you so much, Karima. Is this a kind of differentiation you would do with your students? Is my final question before we move on. So that was a lot. Very good. Eva says it was a good walkthrough. I like that. All right. So for feeling good about it, we feel like we have a good understanding of differentiated instruction. I'm not going to keep us on this any longer. Let's get into generative AI. So before we start, this is important. I need to, to do my, my question, my little diagnostic assessment. What do you know about AI? So teachers in the chat, if you can tell me, have you played with AI? Do you know anything about AI? Are you hearing about AI? Are you using it? What does AI mean? I keep saying that like everybody knows what I'm talking about. What is AI? I'm looking over here at the chat. I want to see some of those ideas. Oh, and my chat got pinned. That's why I'm not seeing anything pop up. There it go. Oh, there we go. All right. Artificial intelligence. That's right. So AI from Karima is artificial intelligence. It's a kind of machine that can do anything. It's got, it does, generative AI is very much a thing. It's like an assistant, that's true. It makes life easier, I love that, it makes life easier. There are lots of different ways to use AI. What are some of the AI tools that you're using? Does anyone have a name for a tool? They can, they can save time, they help to think like machines. ChatGPT, that's right, I love ChatGPT. Magic School, Magic School is pretty phenomenal. I am not a super user of Magic School, but I've seen some of the things that it does, and that is a great act, uh, uh, AI uh, application. Almost all of our activities, well, Samarina is using it almost all of the activities, wow. Benita, we get information. Gamma, I haven't heard of Gamma. Research Rabbit, that's a new one. For translations, it's great for translations. 
there are so many there are Microsoft Image Center. My goodness, there are some here that even I have not heard about. And I think this is a really great example. One of the first things that I think it's really important to understand about AI before we jump into the deep end of AI is whatever you know today could be completely different next year. And I think that's one of the most important things that we have to keep in mind. Um, many of us know that we started working with AI or hearing about it in November of 2022. That's barely a year and a half ago. And already some AI tools that were uh, very popular in that time have disappeared completely. So this is a technology that is changing very, very rapidly. And I would say that this is one of the key 21st century skills of learning that both we and our students will need to be familiar with and be ready to use for success as we get into the mid 20th, 21st century. So there's a lot that to, to know, um, and we're going to break into that. Rena says they're, they're all generate non-human text, they're smart machines, all of those things, very true. So most of us have probably heard of ChatGPT. Um, I'm sure they've seen it already in the chat, so I know that we have. And in fact, some of the applications that you're talking about are actually using ChatGPT in the back end. So even Magic School is using an API that integrates with ChatGPT. Um, something else to keep in mind is that you might not see ChatGPT. You may have a different name for the AI tool that you're using. But they, that tool may actually be using ChatGPT in the background. This is a very, very common feature um, of AI is that we see it being used in a lot of applications. It was publicly released in 2022, and it has free and paid versions. And teachers, I'm going to give you my, my big tip if you're using the free version of ChatGPT during the United States hours of 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., it can be very difficult to access ChatGPT because everybody in the world in business is trying to get onto it. But if you're using it on the evenings or early in the morning, there are not so many people who are working with it, you'll find it's more accessible. So if you've ever tried to use it and seen that it's too many or there's a timeout notice or you have to wait, the, the quick secret of that is wait until after the United States business hours, and that's a great time. So it's perfect for teachers because that's when you're planning all of your lessons anyway. That's my, my first little bit of advice for working with GPT um, is to know that. Um, the, free, the, the paid tier is worthwhile if you're using it a lot, um, but it really is up to you as the teacher. And I find that the free tier, especially after hours, is very effective, so keep that in mind. And GPT is phenomenal. It can do a lot of things. There's not much it can't do. Um, so it's it's great for, for generating text. You can do prompts, sample dialogues. And if you're using Microsoft Office, which I know a lot of us do, then GPT is integrated into the Office suite now. So you're going to see that appear as co-pilot in some of the applications that is actually running on chat GPT algorithms. So this is already embedded in to our applications, which raises some questions for us as English teachers. If we're teaching English and you have English it is embedded, your AI is embedded in Word or your English application, then our students are already writing in a world where AI is helping them whether they're asking for it or not. So that's something that's very helpful for us to keep in mind. And then Rana has a good question. How can I use AI carefully without trapping myself in plagiarism? That's a great question, and we're going to kind of, I'll show you some ways to make sure that the output of the AI that you're working with is really something that you're generating. But one of the things that I always recommend is no matter what you produce with AI, you're always going to be going back into that um, and making sure that you have human oversight. That's really important there. So ChatGPT, so here's another one. Some of you may know this one, Gemini. Has anyone here worked with Gemini? Um, I'm just kind of curious, you throw a yes in there. Yes, okay, I see some yeses. So Gemini is different from ChatGPT. It came out in 2023, so it's a, it's a little bit younger than ChatGPT at this point. Uh, let's see, Hala has used it for designing lessons and role plays. It's Google, that's right. So the big difference between GPT and um, OpenAI's ChatGPT 
is that Gemini is actually the AI from Google that has been released publicly. Um, it also has a free and a paid tier. Um, and again, the same thing with Gemini is true for ChatGPT. The best time to use that if you're finding it's throttled or it's hard to get into is to go in after hours in the US. So after 5 p.m. in the United States, you should have a lot more opportunity to use them. Um, it's a really great tool. They're both great. And if you haven't used it before, we're going to get a chance to do that today. So you're going to play with uh, those with me. And then this is the third one. I wanted to show the generative AIs. These are specifically text generation. Has anyone here, and I, I didn't change this on my screen, that's okay, but Claude, it's from Anthropic. Have you heard of Claude? It's kind of a funny name. It's just like we have ChatGPT, Gemini, and then Claude. It's like your next door neighbor. All right, so you see some no's there. Um, Claude, oh, you, J Joe likes it. Joe Dale says it's excellent. I, I, I'll be honest, I am not played around as much with Claude. So maybe, Joe, if you have some ideas, you can drop and share those with us. I'd love to hear about it. Um, Karmia, uh, Karima is her but not used. I've got a couple of notes in there. So Claude, this is actually, it's supported by Google, so it's not separate from Google, but it is different from Gemini. These are two slightly different um, AI applications. Um, the one big difference, and I think this is interesting, if you're using Google Classroom, so any teachers here that are using Google Classroom, Google plans to integrate Gemini into the Google Classroom suite in 2024. So in the end of this year, starting in September, you're going to have access to Gemini in Google Classroom. If you didn't know that, that's something to know. With, and with uh, Claude by Anthropic, that is not being integrated into the Google suite or the Google tools. But I think this is important for us as teachers to be aware of because basically, both of the big applications that we use to help our students learn to read, to write, um, Microsoft Office's Word or Google Docs, both of those applications are going to have AI embedded. And you may have already experienced as a teacher when you start typing a sentence and then suddenly a lot of words appear. That's actually AI finishing your sentence for you, predicting what it is that things you want to say based on what you've typed. We as educators need to consider how that's going to change our students' experience, especially when it comes to writing. Um, so we're not going to talk too much about that today, but it is something to keep in mind is the way that we write especially is very much changing because of how these AI tools work, and that is something that we should think about. Gemini is integrated with most Google Workspace, that's true. Um, and Joe says of uh, Claude, you can input a lot more text in one go. So sometimes we copy and paste text in or we add in text. Um, so that's a little bit bigger. The context went, the output is more succinct. That's great to know because GPT can definitely go on sometimes, this is true. So there are a couple of different ways that we can use our AI tools to support English language teaching. Um, I've, I've put some up here just so that we have a reference that we can look at. I love it for lesson planning. My goodness, it makes lesson planning so easy. Um, you can create worksheets and flashcards and more. And I mean, I, I'm a great teacher. I had a lot of tricks for this. If I created a good worksheet, I would use that as a foundation and make 10 worksheets based on that worksheet. I think we've all done that before. But now with ChatGPT, I can make one good worksheet, cut and paste it to ChatGPT and ask it to make eight more like it, and it's done in 30 seconds, where for me that used to take about an hour and 30 minutes after school. So this, it's just phenomenal. If you have not used ChatGPT to make Quizlet cards yet, you are missing out. It is fantastic. We're gonna look at how we can do that today. Um, it's phenomenal for designing tasks. However, sometimes GPT will design tasks that are very impractical and that you absolutely cannot do. So there are a lot of things that we as educators have to monitor with the output for GPT. I think that's important. It's good for developing a visual and audio content. GPT now has embedded visual production. They don't have video yet, but there are different ways to do that. And of course, we can create content for platforms. So there's just so much more you can do. When it comes to creating materials, though, this is where I really have a lot of fun. I like ideas. I, I'm not like, I, I'm, a, I'm a let me make my own content type of teacher. I don't want GPT to do all of that for me. Making materials is some of the best part of the job. But sometimes I run out of ideas. So brainstorming ideas, 
creating outlines is fantastic, um, developing learning objectives. And here's something that some teachers don't know, but it's useful. If you're using the Common European Framework of Reference, or if you use WIDA, or if you use the Global Scale of English, ChatGPT and Gemini know these scales, and they can actually use those scales to level your content. So you can actually generate differentiated content at different levels with the right instructions into your AI. So this is a really phenomenal usage. Um, we can also use it to uh, for differentiation, which is what we're going to do today. So there are so many different ways that we can use this. And now I really want to get into the next part of this, which is how do we then use differentiated instruction for AI? So before we jump in, my final thoughts here, especially if you've never used AI before or if you've only just started working with it, the most important way to work with this, you will hear a lot of people on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn who will tell you about prompt engineering and how important that is. Um, the reality is that these tools are changing and adapting so quickly that prompt engineering is actually not a very useful skill and you can spend way too much time worrying about your prompts and not actually getting to what you need from that AI content. The best way to work with your, your AI, especially generative AI, is think of it like a teaching assistant. It knows everything that you know. It's, it has, it's got some TESOL training, it has a TESOL certificate. It understands what you're talking about when you tell it, I want you to do an information gap activity. So just give it the instruction, give it the information the same way that you would pass off something to a teacher's assistant. Now, I know for probably 90% of you on the call, you're like, Sarah, that's funny. I've never had a teaching assistant. <laughs> I would love to have a teaching assistant. That's, I've never had that in my entire career. So the great thing, and, and this really is an equity issue. If you've never had access to that before, this is one of the most wonderful things about GPT is now everyone does. So you will have to think about, just like an assistant, what do you need to give it in order to have it make productive content for you? So here, what I like to, to think about is what's your objective? That's a very useful place to start. Um, we want to think about the context that can be very helpful. What are the target language and the concepts? What are the appropriate tasks? It is useful to give it some structure so that you can always make sure that you get good output. And then we always need to check the content. Um, so we have a question from Karima. Uh, this is a good one. Can you highlight appropriate task types? Like, does that mean strategies such as TPR? Yes. If you wanted to incorporate TPR, you can ask ChatGPT to do that or your generative AI to do that. Um, it's really going to be what's appropriate for your class. So we'll show you when we get into that. Uh, yes, maps growth. I'm not sure I know that one, but I'm pretty sure ChatGPT does, but we can go ask it because we're about to do that. Um, and Eva, yes, I do believe our session is being recorded. Thank you for that answer. Um, final thing, and I do have this here, always, always, always check the content. Um, ChatGPT is great at doing things, but sometimes it's not very good at understanding student interest um, at all. So it's not human and it doesn't interpret that. And that's the final thing to kind of keep in mind when you're working with these generative AI models is that these models have been trained on the history of human knowledge, including philosophy, research, science. So if you ask ChatGPT a philosophical question, you're going to get a philosophical answer. But it's not because ChatGPT is thinking about it, it's because ChatGPT has read philosophy. So don't be confused when you're working with these models. They're not real, they're not human, they're not thinking, but they're really based on everything that they've ingested and all of this information that they've collected, producing some answers from their experience, which does mean that they are occasionally wrong. In fact, they're, they can be frequently wrong. So it's always good to trust yourself. If you think that this is not correct, you're probably right. Um, so I always tell you to make sure that you're the last source of authority there um, to make sure that we have things uh, appropriate. So. We're going to jump into some of these AI tools. Um, I was thinking we can do an A2 plus lesson. The one thing that I need to know before we jump into this and get started. So in the chat box, 
what is a good topic for this lesson? What's something that we would all like to practice with? Um, we're we are going to share all of the materials and all of the generated materials we create in our, our, G our bots today, because I do have both Gemini and GPT. Um, I will share all of those materials with you as well. So you're going to get all of our materials from today. You won't miss anything. Um, so topics, ooh, dream jobs. I like that. Any other thoughts? I, I dream jobs, well being. Ooh, that's a good topic. Travel, fast fashion. So many, these are some great topics. I have so many teachers from Indonesia too. I want to make sure we, we get summer holidays. The summer is coming up. That's a fun one. Summer holiday plans. What's a, what's a good topic for this season too? Global warming. That can be a fun one because it's hot <laughs> right now in Chicago. I was thinking about that. Global warming, holiday plans, um, dream jobs, so many different things that no, nothing is matching, nothing the same. Writing and academic, we could do all of these different topics. Shopping is a good one, pets. I think for global warming at an A2 plus might be a bit challenging for our students. Green champion, how to make a good presentation. Ooh, K-pop, we're getting some music there. I love it. These are so many. I'm, I feel like I'm ready to design a whole curriculum at this point. Um, I'm going to, let's see. There are so many ideas. What's a good one? Culture. All right. I think movies, that's always good. I think for, for this lesson, let's start off with shopping. But I'm going to take some notes as we go through. So I'm going to stop this PowerPoint presentation. And let's see. All right. Hopefully everything works out. So teachers, you're my eyes in the field. You have to tell me on the screen, can you see chat GPT? Start shopping, green champion, uh, pets culture. All right, and global warming. All right, I've written down some of those extra topics. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do, um, I, I like to, to just prompt GPT and let it know what's going on. So that's my first thing is I'm just gonna type in what I'm doing here. Um, and teachers, let me know if you can see this, if it's too small, let me see if I can blow this up for us a little bit. Sometimes that will work. This is where we get into the reality of uh, the day. So it, it is gonna be a little small. Um, we'll try to get that on the screen. If you have pinch and zoom, you can zoom on your own screen if this is not coming up correct. Uh, we're going to plan a lesson. So, so we're going to say it's an A2 level lesson. Let's do for speaking. We want to give it the skill. Um, we're going to start with shopping. And I've created a, a little prompt already that I'm going to go ahead and add in here. So this is my little pre-start prompt. I want you to give me a word list for an A2 level class aligned to the Cambridge English profile. If you know the Cambridge English profile, um, that is a good one. I'm seeing some people say it's too small. Let me see if we can fix that for us. All right, did we make it bigger? That's my worry here. Is that big enough now? Can we all see it? And I can make this disappear. There we go. Uh-oh. Did I switch? No, it was. That was unfortunate. We'll just do that again. All right. Uh, is that big enough on the screen now, teachers? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you so much. That was this was the one part of the session I was. I knew that I would need a little assistance from the audience. So again, um, all right, it's hard for me to talk, talk and type at the same time. So if I suddenly stop talking, you know what's happening. Um, so I'm putting in my little bit of starter prompt there. I'm going to ask it to give me that A2 level and shopping as a topic. Um, I want the word, definition, and an example. Uh, and actually, and two example sentences. And teachers, this is where, if you don't know this trick, this is a phenomenal one. I'm going to ask for that output to come in a chart. I'm going to, to click go. You can also hit enter. 
And now here you go and you see it coming up. This is coming up in the chart. Now, what's amazing about this is you can now copy and paste these directly into Quizlet. So if you wanna make Quizlet flashcards for your vocabulary activity, if you wanna copy and paste this into Kahoot, um, this is a really quick way to generate a vocabulary list. Um, as you can see, it's giving me lots of different words here that I can use inside of the classroom. Some of these words, as I said, are at an A2 plus range. My students are currently A2, so I want the words to be a little bit higher than where my students are currently at, so it's a little bit higher than their current level of ability. And it's, isn't it like magic? I see Karima is like, it just literally just popped it right out. All, all of the different words. And you can see now as a teacher, I have so many words. I didn't, I didn't give it a variable to say how many words that I needed. So it just gave me every possible word that it could give me. And it was in the blink of an eye. I mean, and I know you can spend hours doing this and here you go. And you know, I can even do some more. I, it gave me too many words. So I'm going to control it. I want 10 words and make the second example a close. Now watch this. This is where it gets fun. We talked about task types, close activities. Those are a favorite. And it's, it's starting to produce. Here it comes. Look at that. There's my close activity. I could copy and paste this immediately. And now I have something that I can put into a worksheet. And all, again, it's already leveling the words, but you'll notice we don't know what level the vocabulary is. So we're just going to ask, can you do this? make sure that we actually know the level and there we go. So now we have all of the information that we need. We have our curated list of words. And that is, that is really how easy this is. And again, we can immediately pick this up and cut and paste this into Quizlet or Kahoot. So for the different types of applications you're working, this is fantastic. So now we have our vocabulary set. We can really do a lot from here. I can already see some flashcard activities that I might do with my students. I have the closed activities I could have as a worksheet if I wanted to. So this is already, I've, I've got a lot of work that I can do. So let's say we pre-teach our vocabulary for our students. Um, and Gassim asked a question, this is not the free version. You can do this in the free version. Um, I am using the paid version today for full disclosure, but you can also do this with the free version of GPT. It's all about um, the questions. For uh, Joe, I can't show you directly for Quizlet just for the sake of time, um, but basically, and, and this is really how you do it, you just select what you want, um, and then you copy, go to Quizlet, start a new set of cards and paste, and it will automatically paste it across because Quizlet is designed to pick up those tables. So it's really just cutting and pasting the Quizlet. That's all you need to know to do that. Um, but I, I actually saw some teachers do this live at TESOL and I was like, I have to make sure everybody at World Learning knows about that one because that's a super trick. Now, let's say that I wanna turn this into an information gap activity. So I'm just gonna say, I'd like this to be an information gap activity for pairs of students. And I'm just gonna go ahead and hit go. And here we go. You'll notice that this is going to start off, it's giving me objectives, it's giving me instructions. And here it's giving me worksheet A, and it's gonna give me worksheet B. Look at that, everything that you need to do an information gap, it's right here. It's coming out very, very quickly. I will share all of these activities after, um, and I'm going to, to show you, I'll make sure we get a Word file up here so I can show you how we paste this into Word so you can see how that works as well. All right, and you'll notice that the GPT, it really, it's, it's making sure to think of everything here. We have our objective. They're going to practice using shopping related vocabulary. We have an A and B worksheet. It's given me basic instructions. This is really just like a TESOL assistant. It's putting together all of the basic pieces I need for my lesson. And then it says, fill in the blanks, 
by asking your partner questions. This is essentially how we might do that. Um, this could be too scaffolded. I might wanna change this activity around a little bit more, um, having all of it, but they, as you can see, my students do have different sets of words. So this is very much an information gap. Reducing teacher stress, isn't that amazing? Now I'll show you another trick here. We're just gonna do this on the screen here. So I'm going to uh, pin my GPT over this. We'll make it smaller for a second. We're going to bring a Word document over. Um, can you see the Word on my screen? I've just opened up a Word document. We're gonna pin that over here. Can you see Word? Everyone can see that? I changed, I wanna make sure, okay, good. Uh, sometimes when you're sharing screens, things don't come up. So what I'm going to do is scroll down to my materials. I'm going to right here, just take my cursor and I'm copying. So you scroll your mouse all the way down to the bottom and I'm going to right click, copy. I'm going to go into my Word document. Um, this is a, a, another just useful tip teachers if you haven't done this before. When you're pasting in Word, um, paste has different types of options. So if you don't know about that, when you go into Word to paste up in the upper left-hand corner, that drop-down menu will give you different options. And you want the second option to merge the formatting. I find that that works pretty well. So I'm just gonna go ahead and merge. And now you'll see that I've already got that over in my Word application. Let's make that a little bigger. And you're thinking, oh, Sarah, these tables are no good. That's no problem. Once it's in Word, you just copy your table um, and you go over to your table tool. Where is my table design? There it is, sorry. Go over to table design and just pick the first design. And there you go. My information gap is ready to go to print. I can print, I can cut these out. I have everything that I need to get my students started. So that's just this, this is, we haven't even done differentiated instruction yet. We've just done some basic instruction. We've made a little information gap activity with a little close exercise. Um, we can format that. I'm not gonna waste too much time formatting on this uh, show today, but as you can see, I see some emojis popping up there, uh, which we always love to see. All right, and let's get that bigger again. So I'm like, I love the hands up. This is one of my favorite ones. All right, so so that's, that is very quickly, that's just using GPT and what we just started off with like an information gap A, B. But now we want to do some differentiated instructions. So, C and D. So notice my prompt here. And I think this is, this is really important when we're working with generative AI. Sometimes we, we stress a little bit about what do I need to tell it to do in order to get what I want? Again, think about it like a co-teacher. Think about it like an assistant. Think about it like one of your peers in the field and just ask for what you need in, in a very basic way. So we don't have to make it too complicated. All I want you to do, so I'm asking ChatGPT, can you add a C and a D? Because I have information gap A, B. I want a C and a D, it's a little more challenging and ChatGPT can ch translate a little more challenging. I can also say, if I, I want to define that, we can add that in there. ChatGPT and generative AI works very well with variables. So if you want to give it some variables to hold on to, that can be useful. Um, and we want to say no more than uh, eight words in each. So these are the variables, eight words. I'm setting the level a little bit close to A2 plus and B1. So all of these things are setting the level to make it appropriate. And I push enter. And then again, it will do it. And it's, I love it's always so happy. Absolutely. It's, it's always, it's so nice. It's going to give me the CD worksheet. Again, this is the same information gap type worksheet. 
but now it's giving me slightly more complicated material for my students. I have a speaking activity that's ready to go. I can bring that in and there we are. So this is one of the easiest ways to use GPT for differentiation. I love doing it this way. Um, and as you can see, we have the full lesson plan and it even offers that final um, closing activity after your presentation so that you have the debrief to ask the students to share what they found the most challenging and the most interesting. So this is just a very, very basic activity. It's that differentiated instruction act. Uh, it is differentiated information gap. I have different activities. And then, of course, I can have all of my students mingle together at the end and share this information. So I will share all of the materials that we've just generated with you. If you want this, you'll have the prompts as well. Um, that is something that we can take away. So that's with ChatGPT. So let's go over to Gemini. Um, you'll notice with Gemini, I have a few different features over here. One, you can create images. Um, so we can do, we can have a lot of fun there. And if we wanted to create a, let's say a worksheet where students had an image and they had to describe the image using some vocabulary. We could do um, global warming as our topic here. I think that would be a lot of fun. So I want to create two, Im uh, create two images about global warming for EFL students at an A2 plus level to describe in a speaking activity. So we're going to give it some basic information here. Let's see how it does. Again, very basic prompt. You'll note with Gemini, um, it is a, a slightly different feature. I'm going to see if we can make this big enough. And there you go. Check this out. I have two images. What do you think, teachers? For a global warming lesson, are these images that you could use? I'm kind of curious. I'm popping over here. Um, you can do icebreakers and activities, Fazia says. Yes, that's true. Um, for global warming, do you like these images? Would you have your students describe these in class? Um, if you want different images, we can make those too. You'll notice that I, I like this. We have one, which is a polar bear. My concern is in the classroom, one student has a lot more to describe than the other student. So that might be a bit challenging. And so we can go through and add that in. So let's create some content here. So you'll see I'm putting in A2 and A2 plus is the vocabulary. And here you go. So for the image one of the polar bear, it's giving me all of my words. Now you'll notice I didn't ask for definitions. I did not ask for things to be in a chart. Um, it is giving me my example activity. So now we can, we can even go further here and now organize this. And I'm asking for scaffolding. And there we go. So again, I'm, I'm already, I'm building that lesson. And here we go. Look at it scaffold, a slightly different chart presentation than we're going to get with GPT. But there you can see. Now you'll notice here, some of the formatting is broken. That will happen sometimes with these generative AI models. Um, but you can usually get it to do what you want. You'll also note that it didn't make different sets. Um, it was a not as refined. So this is something where I might have a little bit more work that I have to do to go in to fix this. But one of the other nice features, and this is phenomenal with Gemini as a tool, is that you can export this to Sheets. So I'll show you what that looks like really quickly. Um, this is a feature I anticipate will be coming with ChatGPT pretty soon. Um, they weren't able to create that sheet. I got an error notification. So we'll see if we can do it the second time. Um, yes, it did. And there we go. So it put that information into a sheet. And then once I have it in the sheet, I could then begin working with it here. So these are just a couple of the different ways that you can use these tools. And then I can say, So here's my, my final little trick. This will work with GPT-2. I want this to be a differentiated lesson. Um, I want to differentiate, let's say, 
no caps lock. All right, and let's see how it does. So now I'm asking it for differentiation. I'm going to tell it, plan in a PPP format. If you're using PPP in your classrooms, if you have a specific format that you need to use, then you can get these models to plan in that format. Here are the materials. It, it's even going to explain what the differentiation process is for you. So all of the information that you need is right here. It's going to be um, easily accessible. It's giving you the procedure that you need for your lessons, showing you the activities, um, giving the assessment and the extension. And then I can say, this would be the last thing I would ask it to do is to create the worksheets. So this is really how easy it is to uh, work with this. Um, it's, it's very, very simple, and you'll see now it's actually creating my A2 level. It's telling me the level of the worksheet. It's giving me all of the information. It's giving me my A2 plus level worksheet and all of the information. It's everything is here. All I'll need to do, just like we did with GPT, and it's going to be a little bit messy just for the sake of time. I'm going to copy that. We'll head back over to my Word document. We'll start a new page down here. And oops, paste it with the formatting. Um, so again, remember when you're pasting, not to just paste, but you do want to paste with the format formatting. And there you go, your worksheet is started. And now it's just a little bit of teacher cleanup work that you have to do. And you have two lessons that are ready to go for differentiated instruction on global warming. I can even grab um, my pictures so that I can add that to the worksheet by scrolling up or create some more pictures. So that those are some of the different ways that we can do this. There is really, really so much more to learn, uh, but I just wanted to really give you a, an idea of how we can get started with these tools for differentiated instruction. And hopefully I have given you all some ideas to work with today. My final thoughts before we leave, hopefully that was a lot of fun for everyone. Um, my last thing, there are just five things, a couple of things to keep in mind. It's a very, AI, very knowledgeable assistant. It's so helpful this way. Um, you'll hear this sometimes with AI, it is prone to hallucinating. It will make things up. And the worst thing about AI is it will then also defend the things as if it's true. So be aware of that. Um, it is not intelligent, we talked about that fantastic for brainstorming and great for integrating. And there is so much more than just GPT. This is just a, a quick example of some of all of the different tools that are available and there are more. So if you're, I really recommend, it is going to be incredibly important for us as educators to play, 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 play with AI because we need our students to know how to work with this as a skill. These are going to be critical skills. We already know that 85% of organizations globally are using AI in the workplace. So this is something that's going to be important for your students to be successful. And this is also, it's not just the teacher here, we were just using AI to make content. Students can also use AI to interact with content. And there are a couple of different ways that that can be done. But oh, unfortunately, we're gonna go ahead and get into questions um, to, for other ways that we can use AI, I just want to note we're also going to share after the session today an article that I recently wrote on uh, using AI for literacy instruction that covers examples from A1 to B1 for K-12. And in these examples, the students are using AI, not the teacher. So if you're curious about how to get students playing with AI in your classroom, I also have some information there for you as well. And my final thought before we go into questions, and I can't wait to see what questions you have, um, is to just keep in mind that the, there's just so much change. We have all lived through so much change in the last four years. The world is an entirely different place than it was at the end of 2019. And our students are going to live lives that are just full of change. And if the best thing that we can do is to help our students embrace that, have fun with it, play and find comfort, then we're doing the best that we can. And I think AI is, is actually going to make teaching even more fun because we'll have more time to, to think about the fun parts 
and spend a little bit less time doing the, the worksheet part, which can sometimes be very draining. So I think it's a phenomenal opportunity for us, and I can't wait to see that. And so with that, I would love to see, we have some Q&A time for questions. Um, just a few minutes for questions, and then we're going to head into our closing. So teachers, what are your questions? I am so curious. Thank you, Sarmiana. I'm so glad that you love this. Karima, thank you so much. Karima, especially so many great comments. I truly appreciated your interaction. Zinya, thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. I'm glad that this is a thought-provoking session. All right, we do have 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, Karima, absolutely. I really do recommend if you're doing your own training or if you have access to training like this one from World Learning, um, my recommendation is you should be on your weekends when you're thinking about your lesson planning or in your evenings. I really recommend playing around with these tools. If you have something you're trying to do in your classroom, just see, can this tool help you do this more quickly? Um, these, it's a phenomenal opportunity to just start playing around with pieces, so I do recommend that as well. Arun, thank you. I'm glad this was informative. Bob, thank you so much for coming. Olina, thank you. Oh, Markum, I thank you heaps here for, for doing this too. Um, are there any other questions? So we had a question about the learning. And then Eden, if there were, um, and Gina, if there were any questions that came in on the other side. Uh, yes, the recording, I believe, is going to be sent out. Uh, there's will be an edited recording that's going to get sent out. Um, and don't forget your digital badges. Um, those are some pieces that you'll fill in after. We'll have some more information about that before we close. Um, any other questions about chat GPT? Gemini, generative AI, or differentiated instruction? Because I, I would love to answer those questions too. Hi, Sarah. So I saw a question yeah. pop up earlier about uh, Quizlet. Mm, um, yes. Can you show us how to import this into Quizlet? And this is when you were showing us all um, what ChatGPT and the other uh, systems can do. Is that something My you can see? question is. That that it well I I would love to show you and give me a second to see if I have an active Quizlet account because I have it's it was like my Quizlet account I was using someone else's give me one second Quizlet I feel like I created a Quizlet account just for this too so let me make sure all right yes thank you all right let's see if we can do it uh, am I logged in. All right. I am so I'm just checking to see if I have an active Quizlet, and I do not. Um, so with Quizlet, when you're creating those flashcards and you you're in the, the dashboard for creating the flashcards, you can start generating a new set of flashcards, and then you just cut and paste each line from your table. So you do have to do it line by line, but you just cut and paste it straight into Quizlet and then it will be ready to go. And I will note that Quizlet itself has also started to incorporate some AI features um, so that you may see that popping up there as well. We are going to see AI integrated into a lot more of the tools that we're using as teachers. It's coming up everywhere that we're working. Um, so keep an eye out for that. You might see that. Um, I'm, oh, I, Hannah, I love that you like Gemini's writing. It is kind of fun. I like uh, there is a big difference between the writing styles between um, chat GPT and Gemini and I definitely prefer Gemini um, I, the, the way that Gemini creates text is just more interesting to me I find chat GPT to be a bit technical sometimes but both are so useful it really just depends um, will AI be integrated into Microsoft soon yes AI is already integrated into Microsoft um, in fact if you have a Microsoft Windows 10 computer um, or older then you can actually uh, you may have already received copilot which is the integration of AI into Microsoft that is based on chat GPT so um, you can look for copilot if you have that on your computer it will be in the bottom right hand corner of your screen um, and you'll see the copilot there you'll also see it when you're working with Microsoft tools and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again I was trying to get into Quizlet for you but we I did not I was not successful there so I apologize but uh, mm -hmm. Um, if you if you do a search for Bing, um, Bing AI already has Copilot embedded in it. So if you have not played 
with Copilot yet, very similar to what we've been seeing with GPT, um, Claude, and Thropic. You'll notice that, that it can do all sorts of things. Um, again, that we, we can use it as a designer, vacation planner, cooking assistant, um, or create a vocab worksheet about veg, veggies for ET class. Or we can do something like this. I'm just going to do vocab sheets because that's a very quick generation. Um, so this is Copilot via Bing. That's the quickest way to access this is uh, really Copilot via Bing. I'm sharing the wrong screen, aren't I? Let's try that one more time. Do -do -do. Not screen one. Or screen two. There it is. Am I sharing the right screen? There it is. Yay. All right. I did all of that and you couldn't see it. I apologize. Um, I'll show you one more time just so we can see it from the beginning. If you uh, do a search for Bing on, on Google, um, you'll notice that Copilot is one of the answers that comes up there. Copilot is um, the AI that is being done by Microsoft, and there you can see there's your Copilot companion. And just like we did with GPT, I'm not going to, for AT students, we won't make it too complicated. Um, you can see that Copilot, similar to those other AI pieces, will begin to create some things. It might do it a little bit differently. Copilot can be a little bit funny sometimes, so you do have to play with it. Um, but you should have access to this um, via online tools, and you may have access to this in Microsoft Word and Microsoft Office on a computer. So that is definitely something um, that will come up. And uh, Farah Dunn says he has done a couple of different sessions on how to use Copilot. So if you're interested in that, you might want to search around for that. You can also, Copilot is integrated into the Edge browser, and that's a really good note. Um, so you can actually access that from there. It is a fantastic way to get to that as well. All right. Any other, other final questions about AI or differentiated instruction? Um, I, hopefully this was a, a useful learning session for everyone and gave you all a lot of ideas. Um, for how to use these pieces in your classroom. And if we're done with the Q&A, I think, Eden, I'm ready to hand it back over to you, too. But you're on mute. So I know it's, you Thank know, you for it's so that out. one mistake that we can never seem to right? stop making. <laughs> If only AI could solve this for us. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah. That was incredible. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming. We hope that you enjoyed the third uh, webinar in our ELT Classroom Connection series. As I mentioned at the beginning, within one week, we will send an email with a PDF of the presentation slide, links to resources used in the presentation, information about the digital badges, answers to any questions uh, in the WebEx chat that were not addressed during the webinar. So we're gonna go through and see if we missed anything. Um, and a link to our YouTube page where you will find an edited recording of this webinar. So please, again, keep an eye out for that email. It will have a lot of helpful stuff in there. Um, also, we live streamed this webinar on our Facebook page. Um, I can drop the link in the chat, but please feel free to go check out the recording of the stream there until you get that follow-up email with the YouTube recording. Thanks. All right, teachers, have a great evening. If you are all the way on the other side of the world in Indonesia um, or in Myanmar or in New York or in Virginia, wherever you are, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, it was my absolute pleasure to present for this audience. I, I love this community so much. So thank you for having me. And I look forward to, to seeing some more stuff from World Learning in the future. Have a fantastic Wednesday wherever you are, and I can't wait to see what you come up with with uh, generative AI for your students and how you're going to use that for differentiation. So have a great week, and I, I look forward to seeing you all again soon.